Chapter Four of A Voyage to the South Sea. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Voyage to the South Sea by William Bly. Chapter Four. Passage towards Van Diemen's Land. Make the Island of Saint Paul. Arrival in Adventure Bay. Native scene. Sail from Van Diemen's Land. Seventeen eighty-eight, July. We lost sight of the land the day after leaving Paltz Bay, and steered towards the east-southeast, having variable winds the first week with much thunder, lightning, and rain. The remainder of this passage the winds were mostly between the south and west blowing strong. There were almost every day great numbers of pintada, albatrosses, blue petrels, and other oceanic birds about us, but it was observed that if the wind came from the northward only for a few hours the birds generally left us and their presence again was the forerunner of a southerly wind sunday thirteen the variation of the compass was thirty degrees thirty four minutes west which was the greatest variation we found in this track our latitude thirty six degrees twenty eight minutes south and longitude thirty nine degrees zero minutes east sunday twenty the latitude at noon was forty degrees thirty minutes south and longitude sixty degrees seven minutes east we were at this time scudding under the foresail and close reefed main topsail the wind blowing strong from the west an hour after noon the gale increased and blew with so much violence that the ship was almost driven forecastle under before we could get the sails cleared up as soon as the sails were taken in we brought the ship to the wind lowered the lower yards and got the top-gallant masts upon deck which eased the ship very much monday twenty one we remained lying to till late the next morning when we bore away under a reefed foresail in the afternoon the sea ran so high that it became very unsafe to stand on we therefore brought to the wind again and remained lying to all night without accident excepting that the man at the steerage was thrown over the wheel and much bruised tuesday twenty two towards noon the violence of the storm abated and we again bore away under the reefed foresail our latitude at noon thirty eight degrees forty nine minutes south in the afternoon saw some whales we continued running to the eastward in this parallel it being my intention to make the island st paul monday twenty eighth on monday the twenty eighth at six in the morning we saw the island bearing east by north twelve leagues distant between ten and eleven o'clock we ran along the south side at about a league distant from the shore there was a verdure that covered the higher parts of the land but i believe it was nothing more than moss which is commonly found on the tops of most rocky islands in these latitudes we saw several whales near the shore the extent of this island is five miles from the east to west and about two or three from north to south as we passed the east end we saw a remarkable high sugar-loaf rock abreast of which i have been informed is good anchoring in twenty-three fathoms the east point bearing southwest by south by true compass i had this information from the captain of a dutch packet in which i returned to europe he likewise said there was good fresh water on the island and a hot spring which boiled fish in as great perfection as on a fire by his account the latitude which he observed in the road is thirty eight degrees thirty nine minutes south and from the anchoring place the island of amsterdam was in sight to the northward we had fair weather all the forenoon but just at noon a squall came on which was unfavourable for our observation i had however two sets of double altitudes and a good altitude exactly at noon according to the timekeeper the results of these gave the latitude of the centre of st paul thirty eight degrees forty seven minutes south the longitude i make seventy seven degrees thirty nine minutes east the variation of the compass taking the mean of what was observed to be the day before we saw the island and the day after is nineteen degrees thirty minutes west 
At noon we were three leagues past the island. We kept on towards the east-southeast, and for several days continued to see rock weed, which is remarked to be generally the case after ships pass St. Paul's, but to the westward of it very seldom any is seen. August. Wednesday, 13. In latitude 44 degrees 16 minutes south, longitude 122 degrees 7 minutes east, I observed the variation of the compass to be 6 degrees 23 minutes west. I had no opportunity to observe it again till in the latitude of 43 degrees 56 minutes south, longitude 133 degrees 16 minutes east, when it was 1 degree 38 minutes east, so that we had passed the line of no variation. In 1780, on board the Resolution in latitude 44 degrees 23 minutes south, longitude 131 degrees 28 minutes east, the variation was observed 6 degrees 0 minutes west, which is a remarkable difference. We had much bad weather with snow and hail, and in our approach to Van Diemen's Land nothing was seen to indicate the nearness of the coast, except a seal, when we were within the distance of twenty leagues. Tuesday, 19. At ten o'clock this afternoon we saw the rock named the Mewstone, that lies near the southwest cape of Van Diemen's Land, bearing northeast about six leagues. The wind blew strong from the northwest. As soon as we had passed the Mewstone, we were sheltered from a very heavy sea which ran from the westward. At eight o'clock at night, we were abreast of the South Cape when the wind became light and variable. Saw several fires inland. The Mewstone is a high, bold rock that lies five leagues to the southeast of the southwest cape, and is the part that all ships bound this way should endeavor to make. Its latitude is 43 degrees, 46 or 47 minutes. Several islands lie to the northward between that and the main, among which, bearing north by west from the Mewstone, is a high rock much resembling it, and north-northeast from the Mewstone, on the mainland, is a remarkable high mountain, which in this direction appears notched like a coxcomb, but as viewed from the eastward seems round. Wednesday, 20. All the 20th we were endeavoring to get into Adventure Bay, but were prevented by variable winds. The next morning at 5 o'clock we anchored in the outer part, and at sunrise weighed again. At noon we anchored well in the bay and moored the ship, Penguin Island bearing north fifty seven and one half degree east, about two miles distance, Cape Frederick Henry, north twenty three degrees east, and the mouth of the lagoon south sixteen degrees east. In our passage from the Cape of Good Hope the winds were mostly from the westward with very boisterous weather, but the one great advantage that this season of the year has over the summer months is in being free from fogs. I have already remarked that the approach of the strong southerly winds is announced by many kinds of birds of the albatross or petrel tribe, and the abatement of the gale, or a shift of wind to the northward, by their keeping away. The thermometer also very quickly shows when a change of these winds may be expected by varying sometimes six or seven degrees in its height. I have reason to believe that, after we passed the island St. Paul, there was a westerly current, the ship being every day to the westward of the reckoning, which, in the whole, from St. Paul to Van Diemen's Land, made a difference of four degrees between the longitude by the reckoning and the true longitude. Thursday, 21. The ship being moored, I went in a boat to look out for the most convenient place to wood and water at, which I found to be at the west end of the beach, for the surf, though considerable, was less there than at any other part of the bay. The water was in a gully, about sixty yards from the beach. It was perfectly good, but, being only a collection from the rains, the place is always dry in the summer months, for we found no water in it when I was there with Captain Cook in January 1777. We had very little success in hauling the seine. About twenty small flounders and flat-headed fish called foxes were all that were taken. 
I found no signs of the natives having lately frequented this bay, or of any European vessels having been here since the resolution and discovery in 1777. From some of the old trunks of trees then cut down I saw shoots about 25 feet high and 14 inches in circumference. In the evening I returned on board. Friday, 22. The next morning, the 22nd, at daylight, a party was sent on shore for wooding and watering under the command of Mr. Christian and the gunner, and I directed that one man should be constantly employed in washing the people's clothes. There was so much surf that the wood was obliged to be rafted off in bundles to the boat. Mr. Nelson informed me that in his walks today he saw a tree in a very healthy state, which he measured and found to be thirty-three and a half feet in girt. Its height was proportioned to its bulk. Saturday, 23. The surf was rather greater than yesterday, which very much interrupted our wooding and watering. Nelson today picked up a male opossum that had been recently killed, or had died, for we could not perceive any wound unless it had received a blow on the back where there was a bare spot about the size of a shilling. It measured fourteen inches from the ears to the beginning of the tail, which was exactly the same length. Most of the forest trees were at this time shedding their bark. There are three kinds, which are distinguished from each other by their leaves, though the wood appears to be the same. Many of them are full one hundred and fifty feet high, but most of those we cut down were decayed at the heart. There are, besides the forest trees, several other kinds that are firm, good wood, and may be cut for most purposes except masts. Neither are the forest trees good for masks on account of their weight and the difficulty of finding them thoroughly sound. Mr. Nelson asserted that they shed their bark every year, and that they increase more from the seed than by suckers. I found the tide made a difference of full two feet in the height of the water in the lake at the back of the beach. At high water it was very brackish, but at low tide it was perfectly fresh to the taste, and soap showed no sign of its being the least impregnated. We had better success in fishing on board the ship than by hauling the seine on shore, for with hooks and lines a number of fine rock cod were caught i saw today several eagles some beautiful blue plumaged terns and a great variety of parakeets a few oyster catchers and gulls were generally about the beach and in the lake a few wild ducks monday twenty five being in the want of plank i directed a saw pit to be dug and employed some of the people to saw trees in the plank the greater part of this week the winds were moderate with unsettled weather friday twenty nine on friday it blew strong from the southwest with rain thunder and lightning we continued to catch fish in sufficient quantities for everybody and had better success with the seine we were fortunate also in angling in the lake where we caught some very fine tench some of the people felt a sickness from eating mussels that were gathered from the rocks but I believe that it was occasioned by eating too many. We found some spider crabs, most of them not good, being of the female sort and out of season. The males were tolerably good and were known by the smallness of their two foreclaws or feeders. We saw the trunk of a dead tree on which had been cut A.D. 1773. The figures were very distinct, even the slips made with the knife were discernible. This must have been done by some of Captain Furneaux's people in March 1773, fifteen years before. The marks of the knife remaining so unaltered, I imagine the tree must have been dead when it was cut, but it serves to show the durability of the wood, for it was perfectly sound at this time. I shot two gannets. These birds were of the same size as those in England. Their color is a beautiful white, with the wings and tail tipped with jet black and the top and back of the head of a very fine yellow. Their feet were black with four claws, on each of which was a yellow line the whole length of the foot. The bill was four inches long, without nostrils, and very taper and sharp pointed. The east side of the bay being not so thick of wood as the other parts, and the soil being good, I fixed on it, at Nelson's recommendation, as the most proper situation for planting some of the fruit trees which I had brought from the Cape of Good Hope. 
A circumstance much against anything succeeding here is that in the dry season the fires made by the natives are apt to communicate to the dried grass and underwood and to spread in such a manner as to endanger everything that cannot bear a severe scorching we however chose what we thought the safest situations and planted three fine young apple trees nine vines six plantain trees a number of orange and lemon seed cherry stones plum peach and apricot stones pumpkins also two sorts of indian corn an apple and pear kernels the ground is well adapted for the trees being of a rich loamy nature the spot where we made our plantation was clear of underwood and we marked the trees that stood nearest to the different things which were planted nelson followed the circuit of the bay planting in such places as appeared most eligible i have great hopes that some of these articles will succeed the particular situations i had described in my survey of this place but i was unfortunately prevented from bringing it home near the watering place likewise we planted on a flat which appeared a favourable situation some onions cabbage roots and potatoes for some days past a number of whales were seen in the bay they were of the same kind as those we had generally met with before having two blow holes in the back of the head september monday one on the night of the first of september we observed for the first time signs of the natives being in the neighbourhood fires were seen on the low land near cape frederick henry and at daylight we saw the natives with our glasses as i expected they would come round to us i remained all the forenoon near the wooding and watering parties making observations the morning being very favourable for that purpose i was however disappointed in my conjecture for the natives did not appear and there was too great a surf for a boat to land on the part where we had seen them tuesday two the natives not coming near us i determined to go after them and we set out in a boat towards cape frederick henry where we arrived about eleven o'clock i found landing impracticable and therefore came to a grapple in hopes of their coming to us for we had passed several fires after waiting near an hour i was surprised to see nelson's assistant come out of the wood he had wandered thus far in search of plants and told me that he had met with some of the natives soon after we heard their voices like the cackling of geese and twenty persons came out of the wood twelve of whom went round to some rocks where the boat could get nearer to the shore than we then were those who remained behind were women we approached within twenty yards of them but there was no possibility of landing and i could only throw to the shore tied up in paper the presents i had intended for them i showed the different articles as i tied them up but they would not untie the paper till i made an appearance of leaving them they then opened the parcels and as they took the articles out placed them on their heads on seeing this i returned towards them when they instantly put everything out of their hands and would not appear to take notice of anything we had given them after throwing a few more beads and nails on shore i made signs for them to go to the ship and they likewise made signs for me to land but as this could not be effected i left them in hopes of a nearer interview at the watering-place when they first came in sight they made a prodigious clattering in their speech and held their arms over their heads they spoke so quick i could not catch one single word they uttered we recollected one man whom we had formerly seen among the party of the natives that came to us in seventeen seventy seven and who is particularized in the account of captain cook's last voyage for his humour and deformity some of them had a small stick two or three feet long in their hands but no other weapon their colour as captain cook remarks is a dull black their skin is scarified about their shoulders and breast they were of a middle stature or rather below it one of them was distinguished by his body being covered with red ochre but all the others were painted black with a kind of soot that was laid on so thick over their faces and shoulders that it is difficult to say what they were like they ran very nimbly over the rocks had a very quick sight and caught the small beads and nails which i threw to them with great dexterity 
They talked to us sitting on their heels with their knees close into their armpits and were perfectly naked. In my return towards the ship I landed at the point of the harbour near Penguin Island and from the hills saw the water on the other side of the low isthmus of Cape Frederick Henry which forms the bay of that name. It is very extensive, and in or near the middle of the bay there is a low island. From this spot it has the appearance of being a very good and convenient harbour. The account which I had from Brown, the botanist assistant, was that in his search for plants he had met an old man, a young woman, and two or three children. The old man at first appeared alarmed, but became familiar on being presented with a knife. He nevertheless sent away the young woman who went very reluctantly. He saw some miserable wigwams in which were nothing but a few kangaroo skins spread on the ground and a basket made of rushes. Among the wood that we cut we found many scorpions and centipedes with numerous black ants that were an inch long. We saw no mosquitoes, though in the summer months they are very troublesome. What is called the New Zealand tea plant grew here in great abundance, so that it was not only gathered and dried to use as tea, but made excellent brooms. It bears a small pointed leaf of a pleasant smell, and its seed is contained in a berry, about the size of a pea, notched in the five equal parts on the top. The soil, on the west and south sides of the bay, is black mold with a mixture of fine white sand, and is very rich. The trees are lofty and large, and the underwood grows so close together that in many places it is impassable. The east side of the bay is a rich, loamy soil, but near the tops of the hills is very much encumbered with stones and rocks, the underwood thinly placed and small. The trees on the south, southeast, and southwest sides of the hill grow to a larger size than those that are exposed to the opposite points, for the sides of the trees open or exposed to the north winds are naked with few branches, while the other sides are in a flourishing state. From this I do not infer that the equatorials are more hurtful than the polar winds, but that the trees by their situation were more sheltered from the one for from the other. Wednesday, 3. A calm prevented our sailing today. The friendly interview we had had with the natives made me expect that they would have paid us a visit, but we saw nothing more of them except fires in the night upon the low land to the northward. The result of the observations I made here reduced to Penguin Island. Place it in 43 degrees 21 minutes, 11 seconds south latitude, and in longitude 147 degrees 33 minutes, 29 seconds east, which scarcely differs from the observations made in 1777. The variation of the compass observed on shore was 8 degrees 38 minutes east, and on board the ship 8 degrees 29 minutes east. It was high water at the change of the moon at 49 minutes past 6 in the morning. The rise was 2 feet 8 inches. Southerly winds, of any continuance, make a considerable difference in the height of the tides. Thursday, 4. This forenoon, having a pleasant breeze at northwest, we weighed anchor and sailed out of Adventure Bay. At noon, the southernmost part of Maria's Isles bore north 52 degrees east, about five leagues distant, Penguin Island south 86 degrees west, and Cape Frederick Henry north 65 degrees west. In this position we had soundings at 57 fathoms, a sandy bottom. Latitude observed 43 degrees 22 minutes south. The southern part of Maria's Islands lay in latitude 43 degrees 16 minutes south. The country is not, in general, woody, but in some of the interior parts there appeared great abundance. Among these islands I have no doubt of there being many convenient places for shipping. On the east side, in latitude 42 degrees 42 minutes south, in longitude 148 degrees 24 minutes east, in July 1789, Captain Cox of the Mercury found a convenient and secure harbor from all winds, which he named Oyster Bay. Here he found wood, water, and fish in great abundance. It has two outlets and lies north, a little easterly, distance 34 miles from the southeasternmost island, 
or point, seen from Adventure Bay. Adventure Bay is a convenient and safe place for any number of ships to take in wood and water during the summer months, but in the winter, when the southerly winds are strong, the surf on all parts of the shore makes the landing exceedingly troublesome. The Bay of Frederick Henry may perhaps be found preferable, as it appears to be equally easy of access. The soundings on Adventure Bay are very regular. Near the west shore are some patches of weed, but no shoal or danger, the depth on them being from five to nine fathoms. End of chapter four.